Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. You have to be strong in today's world. Strong. Keep your focus and up. What you believe in how, how to achieve all your dreams. Hey. Keep moving forward. Never accept less than who you are. Live your best life. Hey. Be strong and free. It's a hit back. The Hit Back with Nahasha Black is sponsored by Scotiabank. CJ Atlantic, Bahara Treat and Spa, Atlantis Paradise Island, and J.S. Johnson. And good afternoon and welcome to The Hit Back. My name is Hubert Edwards and I'm sitting in for Nahaja Black. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Let's have ourselves a conversation. You know the numbers to join in, 323-6232. 325-4316 and 325-4259. Our text line is 422-4796. No going back. Davis administration plans. Davis administration, no plan to return to 12% VAT. VAT to be added to exempt medicine. PM defends decision to add VAT on breadbasket items. Alleged victim of police brutality charged with assault in police. And that's the front page of the Nassau Guardian today. When we turn to the business page, the headline indicates that um, Alkitas, the light is looking at financial obligations left by previous government. BPL rate reduction bond is dead in the water, says Minister. Government meeting with multilateral and rating agency to restore economic confidence. Cooper Sanders deciding on timeline to develop Exuma Beach Resort. So those are some of the headlines which are uh, jumping out at us today. But we're not going to get into that. Well, certainly I am not. If you wish to have a conversation on one of these issues, then certainly feel free. But I have some questions. I have some things which I would like to pose today and see if we can um, involved in some sort of uh, engagement of a discussion. And, you know, maybe you have some views on it which will help to refine my views. I may have some points which may help to refine your position, but be that as it may, let's, um, let's have a go. The question I have, the big question for this afternoon that I have on the hit back is, are we having the right conversations? Are we having the right conversations at all levels? But certainly, as it relates to the national level and the extent to which we engage in it as participants, that being all citizens and residents, and we share our views, whether by newspaper, by radio, um, talking on the corner, talking at a bar, having discussions and debate in parliament, having discussions and debate in institutions of importance. The question is, are we having the right conversations? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, are we focusing on possibilities? Are we having these conversations which says, we understand and we appreciate what it is and where we are and what has been and the state that we are in, what we have, how we are performing right now. But here are the possibilities. Here is where we are going. Here is what we will do. Here are the things that we must do. Are we having these conversations? And by asking that question, I'm not saying by any means that some persons or in some instances, the right conversations are not happening. I think really the deeper desire, at least from my perspective, is to see on a more consistent basis 
better conversations, right conversations, conversations which are not being derailed by short-term outlook, which are not being derailed by some type of a tribal separation, if you will, partisan separation, separation of ideology, maybe separation by denomination, separation by class, separation by color, but a conversation which is coming together with the idea that as a country, as a nation, we're in the business of pursuing unequivocally, without fear, without any sort of dilly-dallying to the left or to the right, we are pursuing our greater possibilities. So are we having those conversations? How do we see us? How do we see ourselves? At the end of the day, when you think about a Bahamas, when you think about the people, when you think about the constituents that make up the country, that make up the nation, leaders, followers, doers, donters, that's a new word, when you take the totality of what contributes to the Bahamas, how exactly do you see that? Are you one of those individuals where the first opportunity you get, you will say some of the most unkind things about your own country? Now, if another person was to say that, you would rightly so stop them in mid-stride. Don't do that. Don't say that. And if that individual continue, and depending on how we say, you know, social media will light up and you will have the hashtag dash ba ba ba. You know what I'm talking about. But the question is in your own space, in your own moment, when you speak about the country, what exactly is it that you're saying about it? Are you one of those persons who say, oh, we're not good? And we always try to drag people down. And we're trying to kill each other. And we don't love each other. And we are bad people. And we don't this and we don't that and we don't that. Are you? And how many other persons do you hear behaving like that? And is there a critical mass? And has that critical mass created a energy which is feeding into the psyche of the country? And is there a view? out there that the country is not as good as it could be and not able to do so. What exactly are you putting out there in the atmosphere when you speak about yourself, when you speak about us? How do you see us? So those are some of the questions I have kind of troubling my mind at this moment. And I'll share some things with you why I believe that maybe we are not having the right conversations consistently. But it's important, and I would love to hear from you. We're just not going to have any long conversation today. You come on, tell me what you think, and we will keep it very short. Because it needs to be a position which you have given some thought. Think about it. And ask yourself, and then answer, and then we can share. Are we having the right conversations? Are we? I, re well, recently, recently I had a conversation with uh, a gentleman at um, the office of the prime minister. I happened to be there with a couple of my colleagues from the, the chamber. And I, I don't remember his name, but he's been around forever and a day. He's a protocol officer. I think one of the, from my observation, one of the most hardworking protocol officers I have seen. An individual who just works and he does his job with such um, grace and class. And, you know, he, he, he shouted to me and I shouted back, I, I answered back. He said, hello. I said, hello. Um, he said, speak again because I know that voice. So at least it seemed as some persons hear me when I do speak. But it was, it was one of those moments where 
I had an opportunity to say to him, I, I have watched you and I respect the work you do and I think you do a great job, continue doing a great job. Just in the moment, serving him the only way I could. I don't know him. I don't have uh, opportunities to come into contact with him very often. But this is one of the cases where he shared a couple of things which I won't share here. But here is an individual who thinks from here to eternity, doesn't see himself or his role in time slots. He has one job based on his words, and he does that job to the best of his ability, regardless of who he's interacting with. And it was such a refreshing exchange to say, yes, regardless of what personal views one may have, and I'm sure everybody harbors some personal views, here is the big picture. And the big picture which he laid out on that day and I just don't want to get into the details of the conversation, but the big picture that he laid out that day was, it's really about us and how we present ourselves and how I work hard to facilitate some other persons presenting themselves in the best light in public and being comfortable. And he took that very seriously. I think that type of a behavior is instructive for all of us in whatsoever it is that we do, whether we are street sweepers or we are prime ministers, or governor general, whatsoever it is, whether we are millionaires or we are Joneses, there need to be this type of a pride that emanates from us, that undergirds us, that take us to a different level of thinking in everything that we do. And I'm not saying go out there and just be like everybody else. You can do that in your own unique way. Everyone has their own spin on life. That little oomph that you bring to life, which is different from everyone. But unfortunately, unfortunately, too often, we are not that predisposed. The other aspect of it, which is, in my mind, unfortunate, is that there are some persons who are not predisposed like that any at all and don't even realize it because they are so used to doing the other thing, the things which are divisive, the things which are not pulling us together. But they are too vested, too much invested in difference and differentness and apartness to do anything else. An additional unfortunate aspect of it that some of these persons are some of the most influential individuals anywhere you can find within the country. It's, you know, so some of the times that have its own level of um, influence and pushes out and creates pressure in certain places. So are we having the right conversations? I wrote this recently. I don't know how much sense it makes, but I, I'm going to read it nonetheless. It says, sometimes we may be dying from, dying from hunger while others think we are so filled and brimming over. And I have hunger there in quotation. So it could be anything. You could be dying as a result of not having a job. You could be dying as a result of not having um, companionship or not being able to exercise your ideas and bring them to fruition the way you want. But persons may look on and say, hey, you know, that, 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 that guy have it all together. Everything is fine. And the fact of the matter is, is as if you can be literally connected, be connected to the vine like a pumpkin, yeah? Be connected to the vine and still die. And this is one of the things that we need to be very, very careful of. That in the way we operate, in the way we have the conversation, in the way we go about doing these things, we don't have connected bits and pieces of us which are ultimately dying even though they are connected to the vine or even though they feel or believe they may be connected to the vine. Because the sustenance is just not there. So, are we having the right conversations? 
let me come back when we come back on the other side of this break let's jump right into it and share some of the conversations that i am thinking that maybe we should have just a little bit differently you're listening to the hit back come right back this traffic report is brought to you by shield insurance and prudential law suggestors First look at traffic now, and so far, it's similar to what we saw this morning. A lighter than usual contingent of drivers moving about in the streets at the moment. We've got minor congestion at various locations, but no lengthy traffic lines are anywhere. West Bay Street, it's an easy ride at this hour, either heading home or even into the city. On the east end, while East Bay Street is hmm, barely active, it's not congested. There are no delay lines of traffic getting through the Montague area this time. In the city, Wolf Road, only having a partial flow of traffic going on. No congestions, no delays out there. It's a bit closer on the east end near the Mackey Street intersection. East Street South, off Wolf Road, well, they're also active. But don't get that confused with being really busy. Only after crossing over Robinson Road and heading into the south there towards the roundabout does it get anywhere near bumper to bumper and busy going into the circle there. But really, it's lighter than usual just about everywhere. It's Carmichael Road is an easy ride right home at this time. The $20 million dollar and some other highway roundabout. Active, but here again, no lengthy hangups going on there. Whether it changes in the next hour or so, well, that we'll have to see. When that go home traffic hit the street, if it makes a difference. This National Travel Report this hour being brought to you by J.S. Johnson, the only insurance agents and brokers giving you peace of mind of the Bahamas for over 100 years. Follow the 397 2100 for more info. With your got a look at traffic in real time, I'm VA Double N. Michael was in a horrible car accident. Prudential loss adjusters managed his claim and got him the settlement he deserved. Sierra's roof received hurricane damage. Thanks to Prudential, she and her kids are happy with their claim settlement. Tammy fractured her ankle in a slip and fall. Prudential saved her time, money, and peace of mind. Prudential loss adjusters are here for you whenever a tragedy strikes. Call 322-4026 now. Protect the things that really matter to you. Shield Insurance is the insurance company that grows with you to meet your insurance needs through this beautiful adventure we call life. From automobile to home to life and health, boat, liability, construction and business insurance, Shield has affordable policies, flexible options, friendly service and the expertise to protect your hard-earned assets. Shield Insurance agents and brokers in Nassau call 356-7202 or Freeport 352-5945. Ah, sugar, sugar, let's get sugary. Softer, smoother and amazing skin, no. Ah, sugar, sugar, we're the sugar ladies. Giving you skin soft as a baby's Goodbye hair We'll take good care of you Come visit us at Bahar Treat Spa On East Bay Street Contact us at 323-6711 Or visit us online at www.baharitreat.com We have a new text message from Scotia Scotia Bank is adding text messaging to its communication channels to keep customers updated in quicker and safer ways. As of November 4th, Scotia Bank will be using text messaging to provide notifications on the minimum payment required for your credit card and due dates. Customers may continue to access their credit card statements on Scotia Online or through our mobile banking app. Learn more by contacting Customer Care Bahamas at ScotiaBank.com or call 356 1697. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. National Bahamas. And welcome back to the hit back. We are having a conversation about conversation. Are we having the right conversations? But today we want to we want to focus on as we as you call to share, we want to talk about solutions. Let's let's talk about solutions. Let's remain in the positive. Let's divorce ourselves, at least for today, from complaining about issues, from criticism. Let's let's take the issue. I'm not saying don't I like the issue, but let's take the issue and let's talk about the solutions because every single conversation we have cannot be a win-lose proposition you win i lose i win you lose 
Should we not get to the place where we start to have these conversations from a point of view of, you know, win-win? Because ultimately, if you and I represent the totality of everything that there is, so every time one win, 50% loses. So the question is, how can we create a more facilitative environment where the outcome is not such that you win, I lose, I win, you lose. But that can only start, that will only start when we shift our thinking and the conversations which follow, the way we transact or prosecute these conversations have a fundamental effect on how they will terminate. Now, I wanted to go east and you wanted to go south. Somebody is not going to go in their desired direction if we have to go together. But if we do sit down and have a conversation and explore the pros and cons, I may come to the realization that your direction is superior to mine and ultimately your direction is going to be more valuable for us in the long term so the sustained value dictates that I should acquiesce to your knowledge, to your wisdom, and move in your direction. But it's not a case where you just bash me over the head and say, hey, you know, that's the right way. Well, if you don't want to come, I'm gone. You seek to serve and you seek to show and you seek to create consensus, develop consensus that, look, this is the way to go, and this way may be good for you, but this other way is fundamentally more better for us. And in that really simple statement is where the answer lies in many, many instances. Because the conversations that we are having are often about me and I and you. Positive, negative, negative, positive, however it is. And not so much so about us. About where does the benefit terminate for us? How is it that at the end of the day, we are all good because of what is happening? So are we totally vested invested in win-lose conversations? Or are we willing to terminate that type of a thinking or at least moderate that type of a thinking and start to approach this business of looking at us? Where and how can you and I come together such that the total is more than the sum of the parts. How do we get there? I believe we get there by changing the thinking and shifting the conversations. By divorcing ourselves of the need to win all the time or to cause someone else to lose. But understanding that every single thing that we do within the national landscape that is, we must ask the question, or at least we should ask the question. And if we are not asking these questions, then obviously we are not operating at the op optimal level of thinking which is necessary. And that question is, where is the Bahamas winning in this? You went to left, you went left, I went right. You get some, I get none. In this grand scheme of things, the Bahamas lose. The country lost. Is that the way we want to continue to have our conversations? Is that the way we want to continue to build a nation, to build a country? Or do we see ourselves as having an opportunity to hit the pause button, at least for a moment, to give ourselves time to think and maybe in that space when we hit the pause button, we will behave in a certain way 
which will then spill over for the long term or at least spill over differently than it is right now. Are we willing to consistently ask ourselves the question, are we winning in this? Are, are we always going to be satisfied that I won and the devil take the hindmost? You on your own. At what stage are we going to realize, are we going to come to a clear understanding that until we start to win, we are all losing. In that scenario, in that situation, yeah, one or two persons are going to be okay. Well, more than one or two. Some persons are going to be okay. But the totality of that is that a lot of persons are not going to be. Unfortunately, it is the persons who are most likely to not be okay who are, in many instances, the great drivers of these suboptimal conversations, these suboptimal reasoning. They are the ones that give wind to the sail and give impetus and power to the engine of the divisive conversation by often repeating it, by often embellishing it, by often taking unconsidered or ill-considered and ill-informed positions which just drive people further and further and cloud the reality, create rose-colored glasses. And we see the world in dim terms, different from it actually is. And the question I have for you today is, it may sound a little bit preachy, but the question I have for you today is, are you connected to the vine but dying? Because the vine, the Bahamas, the sustenance that you receive will only be as good as the health of the vine itself. Now, as in everything else, depending on where you are connected, your sustenance may be more. But all things being equal, you're going to find a critical mass connected in some place where it's going to be very economical, the amount of sustenance that you will receive. So the question is, are you willing to make that shift? Are we asking ourselves, are we asking ourselves every time we have an opportunity to present, to speak, to do, to plan, to develop, are we asking ourselves, what does success look like for the Bahamas? Not success for me, not success for you, not success for one group in versus the next. But what does success look like for the totality of the Bahamas, all Bahamian people, all persons who live here and who have a vested interest in being here and contributing and want to see the best of the Bahamas? What does success look like to you? What does success look like for us? So are we having these questions? Have we defined that? Are, are, are we comfortable that that position is absolutely very clear? And do we understand that there is the possibility that we can, generally speaking, all win on a sustainable basis? not always at the same level, not always accruing the same value, but all things being equal in all circumstances would have gleaned or accrue the maximum benefit possible out of that particular situation. It is possible. Or are we just totally arrested to win-lose scenarios, win-lose situation? When it is, is it going to be controversy and then everything else falls in place after so how do we change the the national narrative how do we ensure that the conversations become inclusive that the conversations become sensitive that the conversations become 
welcoming so that it pulls in everyone to the table that the conversation is not exclusive but inclusive that the conversation makes space and consistently creates a stool for anyone willing and committed to sitting at the table at the moment and contributing. Not someone who wants to pull up chair and take up space. Um, you know, there's no space for persons like those. There's no time for persons like those. But for individuals who are willing to contribute to the advancement of whatsoever the circumstance is, how do they, or how do we ensure that we all become comfortable that there's a space there. It may not be taken. The opportunity may not be seized. And that's absolutely fine because that's a decision. But should there be a desire to do so, will it happen? Can it happen? And in the process of happening, are we advancing ourselves? Are we getting better? Are we growing? Are we moving forward? Are we challenging and confronting the things which impact us on a day-to-day -day basis, the things which are not so good. So, I have another question. What are the things needed so that Joe Public, the man on the street, starts to win consistently? I really don't have the answers. I think you do, or you might. But I have lots of questions. That's, I have lots of questions that I can ask. So my question is, how does the man on the street start to win consistently? Start to believe that there is hope and opportunity and greater facilitation for him to win consistently and easier. For him to not have to jump through 500,000 hurdles to come out at the other end with nothing for him to start to believe that I can dream again or I can dream and that dream can be manifested into something great because I am at a place, I'm in a country, I am surrounded by individuals who we are thinking about us and we are thinking about, not that I'm sitting down and saying, Mr. ABC, it is your time now, but the thinking is what do we do to ensure that any Mr. ABC who step in the space and who have an idea, who have an intention, who have a commitment, a determination, who will persevere, who will be resilient, can get it done? How do we do that? So how do we ensure that Joe Blow, the Joneser, who suddenly decide, I don't want to be a Joneser no more. I want to be a multi-millionaire. How does he transition? Maybe a stretch, yeah, but let's stretch our thinking. But how does he tra transition from a place where there may have been a thinking around scarcity? Can't be done, don't have enough suffering, the system beating me down, blah, blah, blah. How does he transition from a thinking of that to a thinking where we are embracing what I open with, the possibilities? I had an interview with Dr. Charles Diggis recently, and he consistently spoke about the unlimitlessness of possibilities. I think that's the term he used the unlimitlessness of possibilities. So even at the point where you would have exhausted that, it then morphs into new possibilities, greater possibilities, because there's always growth, because that's what we do. That's, that, that's kind of the essence of nature. Don't mind people suffering and struggling and look like they don't care and they tell you, boy, I can't bother, I can't manage. Every single human being of sound mind have a clear desire to grow, to be better, to have more, to do more. No mind what you want to hear people tell you. Some of the biggest fights some individual have based on the philosophical grounding that they pursue 
or acquire unto themselves is reconciling this innate need, this innate pull towards things, towards achievement, towards doing more and balancing whatsoever the teachings or the groundings of whatsoever philosophical framework they follow. Ask them. If they're honest, they will tell you it's a truth. Now, over time, some persons have been able to master that balance. But the fact that it is there tells us that all of us want to be better. So it's easy to make the argument, therefore, that as a collective, as a country, as a nation, we want to be better. We definitely want to be better. But how do we get there? How do we start to change these conversations so we get to the point where all of us can be better? Every single person is in a better position. We will wait for the answers that you may have. But we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, I'll share some of my conversations, some of the things I want to think about. I want to see more balance being created around. So you're listening to the hit back. I'm sitting in for Nahasha Black. I'm Hubert Edwards want you to join me on the other side. Don't move. Throughout our lifetime, we must all make decisions. No matter how we choose, the right one just needs to be made. Like having J.S. Johnson Insurance Agents and Brokers as your insurance partner. We've been serving the Bahamas for over 100 years. Whether you need home, motor, marine, or commercial insurance, make the right decision. Call 397-2100 or visit jsjohnson.com. J.S.C., 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 Johnson Insurance. We are working to protect our country, our people, and our livelihoods so that we can move forward. The vaccine is safe. The vaccine is easy. The vaccine is essential for our recovery. If we want to rebuild our economy, if we want to get back to our jobs, if we want to get back to our lives, our families, we must do this together. What does Christmas mean to you? What about making a loved one's face smile bright or driving your own car? CIBC First Caribbean gives you up to 100% financing on auto loans. Apply online and let our auto financing take you places this Christmas. Visit CIBCFCIB.com for more information. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the hit back. To join us, 323-6232-325-4316-325-4259. Like I said, we are looking for solutions today. We're keeping it positive. But we want to hear from you. Text line 4224796. We're talking about how we change the conversation. We're questioning whether or not we're having the right conversations or at least having the conversations in the right way. And how can we do that to ensure that when we talk about us, when we talk about country, when we talk about the government, when we talk about the institutions, we are being empowering rather than being disempowering. We are pursuing conversations which look to be win-win as best as is possible as opposed to win-lose. And we are exploring the idea of being connected to the vine, but yet still, you know, have the high potential of drying out. And that largely is a function of the quality of the vine, or at least the quality of the point at which you are attached, maybe, if we use a pumpkin plant as an analogy. I have a pumpkin plant home, and some part of it look vibrant. Um, some part look not so good. There's a part which I see a new pumpkin on, I'm glad for that because I was about to root it up. But the whole matter is, you know, how are you connected and what are some of the issues? So 
we have a new administration. And as part of this all works, the transitioning, if you will, various ministers are touring the areas which fall under their ministers, health, agriculture, social services, Department of Corrections, and so on and so forth. So persons are moving around and becoming more familiar with what falls under their portfolio, under their purview. What seemed to be consistent is the refrain that, hey, the health tour, we need lots of money, and things are really bad. Not just the plant, but also people. It's not looking good. The Bahamas healthcare system is at a place where the country can be proud of, or not to be proud of. Significant remedial action is required. That's a part of the vine that we're connected to. An important part of the vine, and it's not in a good state. The Minister of Agriculture and Family Island Affairs yesterday, I think, viewed Bamzi and he said, oh, I'm totally disappointed. This place looked like one of those Chinese abundant city, ghost cities. Now, oftentimes, and this, and, and this is why I start the conversation where I started it, oftentimes, because of the way we think about life or the way we view our existence, there is aspect of that conversation which is welcoming, which is music to some people's ears. Because what he said was, for example, Bamze is in a bad condition. What some people hear is, the last administration, Mashup Bamzi. What I want to draw your attention to is the Bahamas has an institution called Bamzi, and it is not in the best circumstance. It is important for the advancement of the country and the Bahamas, and taxpayers by extension is going to have to fix that. Now, it's not about them, we, and I. I. What I just did was to put us in the picture, totally. Us, we. We will have to fix that. So in every instance that we hear something which is not elevating, which is not positive, we have to pause and ask ourselves the question, what does that mean for us as a country? Yes, may make some people look bad. Yes, it may set up some persons to look good, to gain some wins, to, to demonstrate greater performance or greater capability or competency. But in the totality of it, it's one full transaction. It's not a transaction which completed because the way one group of persons met it now makes everything different or the way one set of persons had it before will change its trajectory. At the end of the day, it's the totality of the, con of the transaction. It's part A and part B coming together, which will inform the way the future is played out. And so when the Minister of National Security did his walkabout and went to the, the prisons, and there is some indication that there may be some weakness there based on the reports. I'm just going on based on what was reported. We must ask ourselves the question, how does this impact the Bahamas? What does this say about the Bahamas? What does this say about our penal system? Is it rehabilitative enough? Can we be comfortable that the persons who are going in and out of prison, are they going to come back into society and be good persons because they've been rehabilitated? Are, or are they going into a place where, because of these weaknesses, and I may be extending and exaggerating here, 
because of these weaknesses, persons are going to come out and we are going to be in a state of living hell. Or do you see that as a conversation which says, A fail and now B is the one in charge and things may or may not be different? Or are you seen and say, oh, yeah, 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 so we fail. Now you have it. You go fix it. Let me see what you can do with it. Or do we want to get to the place where we really and truly and fundamentally and with significant conviction marry ourselves to the idea of asking the question, then what does that mean for the Bahamas? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for taxpayers? What does that mean for our national debt? What implication does that have for our deficit? What implication does that hold for our standard of living? What implication does that hold for our next generation, 20 years from today, 40 years from today? What does that say about us in the grand scheme of history as a generation today in charge? How will we be judged? Are we looking at it in that way? And that's what I'm asking about. Are we having the right conversations? Or are we having the conversations in such a way which is always going to be, you know, maybe small, but putting in these little wedges in the fissures which appear, and eventually they just keep getting wider and wider and wider until there's a crack. We have a caller. No, not at this time. Our caller, go ahead. You're on Guardian Radio. Now, caller, go ahead. Are you there? No. So we are. We so we're looking at some of the um, other areas. Um, social services, for example. Social services. There was some indication that there was some high costs happening there. So the question is, again, how, how are we dealing with that? How did we deal with that? And what was the effect and the impact on the, the country? How do we view the picture, the financial picture, from one administration to the next? Do we see that as an ending and a start, or are we honestly and bold enough and, 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 and you know, full with full integrity, appreciating the fact that the transition from one administration to the next just simply represent business as usual, another day for the Bahamas. It's not that something ended with them and started with another. It's that the Bahamas is on a path. Now, Things may get worse or it may improve. Hopefully, things will improve. Things may be good in one hand and it get bad or bad and get good. But the whole totality of that belongs to the whole country. So, how are we looking at these things? How do we see them? Have you sat down as, we, we, as I talk about being connected to the vine. But have you sat down and asked yourself, really, truly, and honestly, not looking for excuses, not looking for uh, justification, not working with euphemism or trying to rationalize anything. Have you sat down in your own quiet time and reflected based on the information you have, because obviously, you know, all of us have different level of information depending on what we're willing to go out and find, or at least what is available. At some point in time, we are all bounded in terms of the information which we have. But have you really and truly asked yourself, what is the true state of the country? What is the true state of the country? And by that question, I don't mean what our deficit is. That's a part of it. I don't just mean what is the quantum of national debt. 
But exactly what is the state of the country? From a social perspective, from an economic perspective, within our communities, as it relates to crime, as it relates to everything which makes up the fabric of the nation. What exactly is that state? And is that state the way you would wish it to be? Is that state the best way we want it to be? And in that contemplation, an additional question would be, are we ready or are we comfortable fessing up to the weaknesses? Because it happens sometimes. It happens at a personal level. I will be willing or I may be ready or more motivated to say, you know, I can run fast, for example. But in the jumping department, I'm not going to talk about that because I know I'm not capable. But the only way we can move forward, the only way we can arrest the issues which plague us is to confront them now. That is the only thing that we can do. So we have to ask ourselves, and we have to be willing to fess up to the weaknesses which are in our country, which is in the nation, which is in the economic arrangement, which is in the social arrangement, which is in the private sector arrangement, which is in all areas. And only then will we start moving forward in having the proper conversations around these things. So again, let's take ourselves another break. And when we come back, we hope you'll join us on the other side of the news. But certainly, keep asking, are we having the right conversation? Or at least, are we having the conversations in the right way? Don't move. You listen to the hit back. Come right back. You have to be strong in today's world strong. Keep your focus and up You believe in how How to achieve all your dreams hey. Keep moving forward Never accept less than who you are Live your best life hey. Be strong and free It's the hit back hey. With the hash of black hey. It's the hit back hey. With the hash of black And uh, welcome back to the hit back, I am Hubert Edwards sitting in for Nahaja Black. She has some urgent issues to deal with today, and so um, certainly a pleasure to be here. We still asking you to join us in the conversation if you so desire, but otherwise we will continue as we have been uh, talking about the this whole issue of whether or not we are having the right conversations or we're having the conversations in the right way, whether we are focusing on the possibilities, the limitless of possibilities that exist within the, 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 the country. How is it that we are looking at these things? Are we seeing them really as just pure challenges or are there opportunities for great growth? How do you see them? 
How do you see the things which face the country today? Do you see them as challenges or do you see them as opportunities? So when we went out, the question was, have you been minded to ask yourself, what is the true state of the country? Where are we? Are we ready to kind of fess up and own up to the weaknesses and to talk about them openly and publicly and to say, here are the areas? Or do we already know them but um, kind of ignore them sometimes? And some, you know, you, you, you get the impression if you listen carefully, sometimes um, it's policymakers and other times it's other individuals. But if you listen carefully to what's been proffered, you get the impression that there is a desire to skirt what truly is because that which has been said sometimes don't necessarily address or at least won't address optimally the issue which exists. And that's why I ask often, are we ready to have that conversation openly? How long will it take for us to understand how good or how bad it truly is? How long will it take for us to have a full understanding of what that national canvas of potentiality is? We have to have these conversations. I know we have a national development plan and we talk about that, but I think at some point in time, we have to have another type of conversation which is short enough, punchy enough, moving enough to be repeated. Like when, um, what's his name? I can't remember the president, but when he said, well, you know, we are going to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. We are going to do it. Now, you know, I'm a conspiracy theorist in this. I don't think they went to the moon, actually. But that's a whole different conversation for a different day. Or at least if they went to the moon, we have been very lazy as human beings to not have gone back there for another 50 years, at least. We have a caller. Go ahead. You are on the hit back. A pleasure. Good afternoon, Mr. Edwards. Good afternoon, Mr. Sparky. How are you doing like, this how afternoon? How are you doing? You know, this, this conversation... I guess it was for so many years, at least mo uh, most of my adult years, I've been hearing this so much. What do we want? Where do we want to go? What is what? Now, there's two phases for my comment today. Is, and mine is basically on agriculture and fisheries. It appears to me that we do very well to, to feed ourselves when it comes to fisheries. When it comes to lobsters and conch and snappers and stuff like that. Um, presently, we could basically find that every day. But when it comes to farming, agriculture, we, 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 we talk about this so often. We basically say the whole of Cowpen Road and the southwestern area of the Bahamas has been designed for farming, farmland. They lease it out to farmers and so forth. But how much of those that one farms do we see actually produce? We talk about the people, people like myself, and I just got some land the other day trying to get that started. We have people around here that I know have been interested in getting into farming for a very, very long time. To get farm is like pulling uh, a tool out of a horse. Um, the leaders seem to hold on yeah. to the farm. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing you, but, you know, can so we, on, can we second, tighten this up to... Yeah, no, no, but you, you're taking long to wind up those Sparky. Yeah, but you know, Satan people come in here, man, they go to talk, you let them talk about anything. No, no, I'm not. We I, got I, a lot of foreigners coming here, and they get to do whatever they want to do. All right. And so the aliens right. try to get something established to do something to do. We can't get nothing to do. I've looked in my country lately, and everybody says that, and I, I have no disagreement, no no ethnic group, no foreign, no no different race or whatever. That. When I look over this, this country, especially the providence where I grew up, for 70 years, May 4th, 1951, and I'm seeing the change in this island where I was born and grew up and walked all these streets. Mm -hmm. And I see foreigners come in my country and taking it over gradually. 
especially in the areas where the poor Bahamian live, especially the Chinese dog on dominated areas. Everybody selling out their property, trying to get some money, so they're moving out, trying to get a house or a car or something. And every place you go, you got Chinese taking over everything. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know where they live. I don't know if they go to church. I don't know what they do after they get out of the restaurants and bars and so forth. Okay. There's a Chinese place right down on Wolf Road. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we have another caller. Caller, go ahead. What are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. I'm so happy. So, a lot of people don't realize truly, truly... Can you speak up a little about. bit more, please? No, I said a lot of people truly don't realize what you're talking about. Let me give you a prime example. We live in a third world country. We can't even maintain our street sign. Simple street sign. Mm -hmm. We can't even maintain our street. 80% of our streets are deplorable. You know, it's, it's a cry and shame as a people. We cannot go forward, like you say, unless we look at the man in the mirror and say, guess what? Do I want better? Not for me, but do I want better for my country? I and think, that's our problem. I, I think that's an important statement. Um, I, I, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's really about the results and it's really about the things, uh, I believe, which advance us, which advance the country, right? It's... You know, it's not it's not always an easy way to look at things. Um, you know, we we are, as human beings, we are in many instances naturally selfish. I I'm not going to deny that. Um, you know, I have I've had many expressions of selfishness myself. But you have to force yourself to think in a particular way. And when you yeah. when you are in when you are in position of um, leadership or you are in position where you have uh, a platform where you can speak, you have to now start to, to shift your thinking and to understand how is it that what you say, what you do, and how you do it can be more empowering. And that's pretty much uh, you know, what I'm trying to advocate here. Uh, how, do, how do we think not about that I win and you lose on the other side of the telephone, but how we can come together and find uh, a consensus position which may involve compromise? But let, right. me, let me leave you with this. Uh -huh. Let me just leave you with this. You, you're all right. There, I have a friend, and we, we're in partnership together. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know something? We're not going in this partnership, like you say, for me to win and for you to lose. Right. We go in partnership for everybody to win. Nice. And that's the truth. We have to go in partnership where everybody wins. I continue to listen, my good friend. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah, man. You too. You too. Yes. Uh, as I was saying, right, there may be instances that where compromise is needed. And I use the word compromise in the most respectful way, not compromise to do bad things. But to say, you know, I have a view or I have some rights or I could impose myself on this particular situation, but for the greater good, I will give up some because it's going to be better for all. But for the greater good, I am not going to say it in that way, but for the greater good, I'm going to step away. I'm going to do the right thing. I am going to be consistently honest in everything that I do, but for the greater good. You rearrange or reorganize the way you behave. I mean, hopefully it is coming from a place of deep-seated conviction, but at some point in time, there has to be that shift. And so... I continue to ask myself a question. What do you see? Are you seeing challenges or opportunities? So as I look around, as I look around, and you can agree or disagree with me, I see an energy sector in the Bahamas which is in trouble, which is weak, which is driven by fossil fuel, which is in many ways behind the technology of the day, Certainly uh, um, for BPL as it relates to its distribution system, it's not at 2021 level. But do we see that just purely as challenge or do we see that as an opportunity to ready and to season the country for the future from an energy perspective? It's going to be a hell of a lot expensive, believe me. It's not cheap to fix it. And this is just me on the outside thinking about it. 
I don't know. I don't have detailed facts. I'm not into that sector of, uh, of the business. But I think it's going to be expensive. But the first thing that we need to do is to say, yes, this is going to be very, very, very expensive. But this is how we are going to do it. We are going to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. We are going to change the whole nature of our energy system. We're going to have a system that meets 22nd century standard, not because it's easy, but because we know it's hard, but because we are willing to do it. Huge opportunity. We're going to make the shift into renewable energy, into green energy, because this is the way we want to move the country. We are not going to make a lot of cry about, hey, this country is going to sink at some point in time because of rising uh, sea levels, but we continue to burn fossil fuel. It may not be significant in the scheme of things, but we're still burning fossil fuel. We're still contributing to it in a way. It might be very minute. In, in, a, in engineering terms, it may be negligible. Maybe a negligible difference. Won't make one heck of a being one way or the other. But we still contribute into it. Our own demise. Think about that. So we have seen for the last decade or so, very, very sluggish growth. Now, are we going to be reconciled to say the Bahamas can grow? Or are we going to jump on the other side of that conversation and say, how are we going to make the Bahamas grow more robustly? Opportunity, yeah? Versus being stuck on the other side of the dial which says challenges. We have a high debt burden. True. Can't share that. Huge high debt burden. Significant. Over 100% debt to GDP. The question though is, how do we deliberate around this debt burden to contemplate how did we get here? What were the things that we did? What were the mistakes that we made? Where was the waste? Where was the inefficiency? Where was the, where was the ineffectiveness that brought us to this point? And therefore, how do we fix that and season ourselves for the future? Challenge or opportunity? Which one you wish to lock onto? Or do we want to simply wake up every single day and lament the fact that we have a high debt burden. It is there. There's absolutely nothing we can do about that unless we pay it off. But are we willing to wake up every day and cry and say, you know, it was put up X amount by this one and X amount by that one? Or are we going to put it within the right frame to say, regardless of how it originate at this point in time, we Bahamas, you and I and every single person else in the country, we owe this. And the generations to come owe this. The question is, how can we work to reduce the burden as best as is possible right now? How can we make the changes to ensure that that burden isn't extended too significantly? And how can we put this burden on the next generation at the lightest possible level, which is, which we're capable of. How? This is when you shift from just being stuck on the challenges and move to opportunity. Because in the space between those two, I think there is growth. Because there's absolutely no way, I can tell you this, there's absolutely no way we pay that debt off without either growing the country or sacrificing some lifestyle, some standard of living. There is a cost to be paid. The question is, how do we want to do this? Well, you know, I don't want to give up any lifestyle, anything. Nobody would want to do that. We don't want to give up standard of living. So let's gravitate towards the other side, which says, Let's earn our way out of this. Let's focus on the possibilities of where we can earn our way out of the current state of affairs that we're in. You see the difference? Are they going stuck on the challenges? 
or you move very smartly into the areas of opportunity. And focus on that. Because when you do, good things are going to happen. And they're going to happen not just for one or two persons. They're going to happen for a whole lot of people. Imagine waking up tomorrow morning and our debt burden is 50% lighter. That won't happen, but just imagine it. What would be some of the knock-on effects? Well, chances are our servicing for that debt is 50% lighter, which means that we have maybe another $250 million to invest in roads and schools and so on and so forth, rather than paying that out to persons who lend us money. Isn't that a better situation for all individuals? Maybe there will be more money to pump into SBDC so that persons can start business, more money to be pumped into the development bank, more money to be pumped into areas which are facilitative of growing other new industry or existing industry which are floundering, we have to shift our thinking from the challenges. We have a large young population, proportionately, compared to many, many other countries. The Bahamas have a large young population. And it also have a very high unemployment amongst young people, challenge or opportunity. If an individual is not working for whatsoever reason and have this desire to work and is willing to be creative, willing to be innovative, if facilitated, then certainly we have great capacity. So no matter how you think the country is doing, you have to now be saying, well, you know, the way these things are going, all of a sudden Facebook near Meta and we start to hear about more about layer one and layer two of um, the internet, and we go into the metaverse and all sorts of stuff. Things which, you know, old people like me are not maybe totally comfortable with, but with a young population. What should we be doing with them? Well, they don't have no job. And they create a burden on the social system. Well, if they are going to create a cost on the social system, why don't we change that from a burden into an investment? So almost the same cost, almost, well, maybe not almost, but it may be more, but at least a portion of what we are spending on supporting individuals on the bread line, on the food line. What if we were to invest that upfront in programs which facilitate individuals so that they can become better, so that they can grow, so that they can learn, so that they can help to pull the country because of the way they are predisposed to think into this new paradigm, this new world which old people like me just have to be dragged into. You're listening to the hit back. When we come back, we'll continue that conversation and I'll highlight some other things. Are we stuck on the challenges or are we going to be focused on the possibilities. Don't move, come right back. If you like Frito-Lay chips like Ruffles, Doritos, Cheeto Smart Food Popcorn, and Funyuns, you're going to love getting a chance to win great instant prizes this Saturday, October 30th at Phoenix Supermarket, East Street South. Join the Frito-Lay Island Wholesale Team between 12 and 3 this Saturday. Make a qualifying purchase of any Frito-Lay's chips or Smart Food Popcorn, and you get a chance to spin and win great instant prizes. And don't forget to put your contact info on your receipt and drop it in the promo box at participating locations for a chance to win bicycles and hoverboards in the grand prize drawing November 27th. Frito-Lay Chips, distributed by Island Wholesale. Tired of banks forcing you to use technology to bank the way they want you to? Your convenience is important. So no matter what your banking needs, Commonwealth Bank's friendly staff are always available in branch for that personal one-on-one service. But when you choose technology, our online and mobile banking app offers you state-of-the-art functionality. The choice is yours. Commonwealth Bank. Bank the way you want. Do you need to insure your vehicle at the best price? With the most options and free installment payments, CG Atlantic agents offer affordable coverage for everyone. Just call 677-6422 to find out how you can protect your vehicle with extra options to keep you covered. Why wait? Call CG Atlantic agents today at 677-6422. 
Visit us online at cgatlanticagents.com or in person at Atlantic House, 2nd Terrace and Collins Avenue. Nassau Insurance Brokers and Agents Limited, trading at CG Atlantic Agents. What does Christmas mean to you? What about the joy and satisfaction you get in starting the home projects you've wanted to do all year? CIBC First Caribbean helps you make your Christmas wishes come true with easy and flexible financing on personal loans. Apply online and smile all the way this holiday season. Visit CIBCFCIB.com for more information. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the It Back. I'm Hubert Edwards sitting in for Nahaja Black. We're having this conversation about conversation. Well, luckily a couple of persons um, joined me. Sparky um, contributed. We had another caller. Otherwise, it would be a monologue. But yeah, we, we're looking at some of the, 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 the challenges and we are asking ourselves, you know, are we going to be stuck on that side of the dial or are we going to flip them and ask, you know, how can we create greater opportunities? So, for example, the location of the Bahamas right next door to the United States, does that give us any type of a advantage? Have we leveraged that advantage to its fullest? Is there more that we can get from that? How do, we, how do we squeeze out greater value? Is there really greater value? Is there? We may not know the answer. I don't know. Um, you know, there may be areas of nearshoring, which is a, is a huge possibility, especially given the, the ravages which countries are being faced in terms of supply chain issues. Is the shifts being created as a result of COVID and the delays, is that setting up some opportunities for us to leverage our location to greater effect? And what about the stableness of the dollar? Is it good? Is it sustainable? How can we sell that some more? How can we leverage that for greater economic impact within the country? But on the flip side of that, are we scared? Are we, are we, are we, well, let me put it this way. Let me not say scared. But are we comfortable accepting the fact that the Bahamas is going to be good for some people, a good much people, persons who have lots of resources, lots of contacts, lots of influence, who can find capital. The Bahamas is going to be good for those persons like almost every single time. And then there are other persons who are going to start small and depending on the era or the niche or the competitive arena that they're in, you know, some persons are going to be good. They're going to get a little bit bigger. But for the most part, the majority of the businesses, they're going to struggle. They're going to stay small. And the main reason for that is there is a lack of internal markets which facilitate sufficient scaling up of businesses. You just can't get enough market to grow your business. But will we be willing to grapple with that? Are we having a conversation that say, hey, on one hand, we have this big debt. On the other hand, we are not growing well. On the other side, we need to grow. But we have small, small, very small internal markets. And that will not facilitate the type of buoyancy we need. And we must be willing to come to grips with that and be willing to make that change. Or are we going to be stuck on the part of the challenge as far as that is concerned? Or grab the opportunity 
be flexible, be willing to change, be willing to do it in a sustainable way, but understand exactly what we're trying to achieve. Think about it. In the last 20 years, name, just sit down and name on your one hand or on your two hands, the big companies in the Bahamas. Which one are they? Big companies. Where do they serve? Who do they serve? Is the market largely external to the Bahamas in terms of persons either coming in or the sale is emanating from here outwards? Which are the big massive companies being developed in the Bahamas which is serving the local population? Then look around at other countries right in the region or further afield and see the difference. Feel the difference. Understand that numbers matters. And your internal markets usually help to season your country, season your economy, give you capacity for export. And don't we need export? Don't we need to earn more? Don't we need to grow more so that we can deal with our economic situations? So which side of this are we going to be stuck on? We have a unsettled public policy for public financial management. It's developing. I think um, it's fair to say under the, the last administration, the minister administration, a lot of work has been done. Acts has been put into place. Framework has been put into place. Implementation may be up for discussion, but a lot has been done. And clearly, there is the signal that this new administration is going to continue that. But we're not there yet. We're not there, for example, at the place where we can fully understand what does wastage mean in the public service? Oftentimes, persons have these discussions about people thiefing money. And I always like to listen to Shivagaleng, who says, well, you know something? If somebody stole that money, then go lock up the treasurer, go lock up the permanent secretary, go lock up a whole department, because it would require such deep and significant collusion. So we don't always take enough time to reflect and ask ourselves the question, what does these wastage mean? Where do they come from? On reflection, on contemplation, some of these are as a result of decisions. Decisions which are very costly. We make a decision to buy A versus B. We make a decision not to act. We make a decision or we drop the ball on something and all of a sudden the government have to pick up the cost. We see errors which are reported in the newspaper on a daily basis where the Attorney General Office didn't defend adequately a particular action, and as a result of that, they lost out in court. These are some of the errors where we're losing out. And so public financial management reform, which goes to the heart of these things, which is designed to hold persons accountable, to build transparency, to ensure that it is more visible where the problems are, and as a result of that, to discourage and ultimately eliminate. If there is corruption, also get rid of that. But we, we, we are not there yet. We are unsettled. And what I would love to see going forward is a state of affairs which says, you know, you see, as it relates to these things like public financial management, um, reforms, um, election financing reforms, governance reforms, some issues to deal with um, equity and equality, we all come together on a bipartisan basis. And we agree that this is how it's going to be for the next 15, 20, 30 years. Because there are some things which... I think are so important and needs common ground. Otherwise, they're going to be unsettled for the long haul. And as a result of that, they're going to be space for wastage and they're going to be space for, you know, messing up. So on which side of the conversation are we going to be stuck? 
There's also issues of unsettled governance reform. We don't have to get too much into that. We talk already about weak, uh, um, high youth unemployment. We have a weak healthcare system. The COVID has shown us, we touch on this, the minister has said we need greater monies to invest. But are we going to be stuck on the fact that PMH or doctor's hospital as it currently exists in their totality is not sufficient to service the country, to provide the level of health care? Or are we going to say, yes, we accept that for what it is, but let the bright minds come together and let us figure out how we can do this together, public-private partnership, the private sector coming together with the public sector to make this better. And in the process, what opportunities are there for us to serve beyond the borders of the Bahamas? Health tourism. For us to provide specialized medical health care where persons from far reaches of the world, seek out the Bahamas, and as a result of that, pump foreign exchange into the country. They, 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 there's another way. There have to be another way. If we have a weak healthcare system, which is not sufficient to serve the local population, then as we build that, if we build that with a bigger vision in mind, with a vision of serving beyond the Bahamian market, not to go serve some other people and leave the local market, but to have capacity which is so significant, which is so effective, which is there that we can do this well for the local space and we can extend to another place, to other people, like Cuba does. Are we thinking along those lines? And are we considering, for example, some of the issues that we're seeing in the educational system, the weakness, the multiplicity of students who have not been on the virtual learning platform, who are struggling for whatsoever reason. Are we thinking about how we fix those and fix those fundamentally, not from the point of view of fixing because of the effect of COVID, but how do we fix the educational system for the next 20, 30, 50 years? We have a caller. Go ahead. How are you doing, Hubert? I am doing great. Yes, and to this awesome station, Guardian Radio, faithful listeners, once and everyone, good evening. Our country, men and women, we already know how intelligent, how gifted, how gifted, or how intelligent we are. The world's first world country, we are people who are educated in them. The gospel we know, we first heard it through them on an on a international level. Yet, the truth, we born with it, and we're going to die with it. Okay? So, I just want on this beautiful Friday evening to wish the Bahamian people Godspeed in your gifts and talents coming to life. The day it has come. And no government, no party, where we are in space and time is beyond government. It's a one world system. Haven't you heard? Haven't you not known about Yahweh, the one who sits on the circle of the earth? and stretch forth the heaven and call you and I his inheritance, you'll have a wonderful weekend. Don't promote that Halloween with your children if you say you are a child of Yahweh Elohim. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. We have another caller. Caller, go ahead. Dr. Edwards. How are you doing, sir? Uh, yeah, I trust that you will have a strong beginning. I really don't like wishing people weak ends anymore. <laughs> it's a little bit too weak for me, and then it yeah. ends too soon. But you know, when you are strong and you begin again, yes, there is no ending in sight. Yeah. But you know, what we are faced with, in my opinion now, in this country, we have three nations living in the Bahamas. The Chinese, the Haitians, and what we could call Bahamian. I don't I haven't figured out what that is yet. 
And when you apply your strategies to educating that group, well, there's one that you don't really have to because they get taught right at home. But how do we bring how do we bring everybody along? You know what I'm trying to get at here? Mm-hmm. Without leaving, saying that you are here, how do we, you know, because look, here's the deal. I have, I, I, I have a situation where I need to get a jump, and I asked this friend, and he said that my, he's, my, my, my battery uh, uh, jumpers were too tall, and he really meant it was too long. And that's the language barrier that we seem to have with, 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 with you know, with, but you have to find a way. How, Hubert, how do we bring everybody along? Could you well, answer that for me? <laughs> how you bring everybody along? No, I really would like to hang up. I, I, I want to know that. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. The, um, the, the, the idea of bringing everybody along uh, assumes that everybody wants to come along. But I think your question is fundamental in that if persons lag behind, they belong and they lag behind, ultimately it will be an, uh, an imposed cause on the country. And to the extent that the, the wealth of the country is the collective wealth of everybody, and the extent to which individuals can independently you know, fend for themselves, then that reduces the burden on the government. I think that there is a commitment to, uh, there's a clear, explicit commitment for those who lead to make sure that all those who belong are moving forward, are, are, are being educated, are being in the best position to live better life, to grow and develop. And the way you do that is, is through commitment, is through understanding and accepting what is in front of you. You know, I I don't I don't I, I don't pretend that the the question you ask is an easy one, and it doesn't have some undertones, uh, or, or at least it don't come with it its own set of challenges, especially from a political perspective, and political because it's the political directorate that ultimately always lead the country one party or the next. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day. The country is only as good as the totality of its people. And leaving some behind, regardless of who they are, leaving Bahamians behind, persons that you're going to be responsible for as a sovereign, ultimately puts the country in a worse situation. If you create by omission or by commission, and I don't think anyone is actively doing that. But if we fail to do some things which create a second class, third class, very, very poor people, ultimately, you pay for that. You will have to send them to the hospital every single time. You will have to educate them all the time up to the highest level possible or be faced with a group of individuals who do not have, uh, who are not educated and fully functional to operate within the environment which they're, 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 they're faced with. So the way we do that, the way we move forward is to make a commitment and to do the things and to put programs and systems in place which are inclusive, which are embracing, which do not discriminate regardless of you know, how you look, where you're from, whether you're poor, whether you're from round the corner or up the road or on high street or low street. But it is done on the basis that this is important for country. And then you have systems in place which can peel back the layer and make sure that persons at different levels are being dealt with. And this this is one of the, 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 the important um, elements which... Uh, local government can bring to a situation. Once you put the institutions and the structures and the system in place and you have that commitment that we all are going to move forward with one vision to make this a better country, then I believe that's exactly how that is achieved. Let's take this our final break and then when we come back, I will share my final points on 
whether or not we're having the right conversations or at least having them in the right way. You have a new text message from Scotia. Scotia Bank is adding text messaging to its communication channels to keep customers updated in quicker and safer ways. As of November 4th, Scotia Bank will be using text messaging to provide notifications on the minimum payment required for your credit card and due dates. Customers may continue to access their credit card statements on Scotia Online or through our mobile banking app. Learn more by contacting Customer Care Dash Bahamas at Scotiabank.com or call 356 1697. We are working to protect our country, our people, and our livelihoods so that we can move forward. The vaccine is safe. The vaccine is easy. The vaccine is essential for our recovery. If we want to rebuild our economy, if we want to get back to our jobs, if we want to get back to our lives, our families, we must do this together. And welcome back to the Hit Back. I am Hubert Edwards sitting in for Nahaja Black. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with you. And we have in this dialogue, sometime monologue, on the extent to which we are having the right conversations across the country in all of the areas, uh, not just at the national level, but certainly, you know, it's important to focus there. So we have a, what I believe is an underperforming agricultural um, agri-industry. I believe it has the potential to do way more. The minister yesterday said, well, I didn't like how Bamsi look. So the question is, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to, to change that? Because perennially, perennially, this has always been the refrain from one administration to the next. This has been the same refrain. Things not looking good, things not managed well, things not at the level that it's supposed to be, it's not meeting its mandate, it's competing with uh, individuals it ought not to be competing with, but how do we shift that? And how do we get to the place where the national discipline says that regardless of who is on seat, this is the direction that we'll go in, this is the way we will do it. The unsettled position on, there's some unsettled position on immigration. There's some stuff in the court. Uh, how do we channel our energy to make sure that those things, depending on where the ruling works out, is in the best interest of the Bahamas and leverage for the best interest of the Bahamas? How do we accelerate the reforms in state-owned agencies, state-owned enterprises? How do we use them and leverage them because they sit outside um, sometimes the, 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 the autonomy of central government? How do we use them to accelerate reforms, to test changes, to move governance further and faster and deeper? How do we use, because they are, you know, they're challenging. How do you fix a, a Bahamas air when you know you need to keep communication with the rest of the islands, right? And it cannot be super profitable overnight. How do you make that shift as an administration? There are balances. But Bahamas here could become an incubator for some innovations, some changes as it relates to public finance reform, as it relates to governance of state-owned agencies. We can start some things there. And so while it may not be a dollar value return, it's a return in terms of structure and system which then helps to feed a culture to sit as an example and then to permeate through the government, the government system, central government, um, related entities, peripheral entities, so on and so forth. We can start somewhere. We can shift the paradigm by taking whatsoever it is that the situation will give us at the moment and moving forward with it. We don't have to hit it out of the park all at once. 
But the question is, are we going to be stuck on the side of the challenge or are we going to move to the side of the opportunity? I believe that right now the Bahamas is in a place where without much convincing, the challenges are significant. I don't think, if I need to convince you that they're significant, then you may have been hiding someplace for the longest while. But every challenge carries with it equal or greater opportunity, says Napoleon Hill, and I believe that. Embedded in every disappointment, every challenge, is equal or greater opportunity. So if the Bahamas is at this point in time having so many problems, significant problems, I didn't say that there are problems. I just read the newspaper and I'm convinced that there are problems because the persons who know are saying that there are problems. But if we have a multiplicity of those, if we have a lot of those, if the quantum of them is that large and we believe that they are embedded in these challenges, greater opportunity, then let's flip the script and ask ourselves, how big is the upside for the Bahamas? Huge big problems signal huge big opportunities, yeah? So when are we going to dig those out? When are we going to bring them to fruition? What are we going to do to ensure that those opportunities are manifested? So if, if, if every single time we are looking at these challenges... And year after year, decade after decade, we are still talking about the challenges. It therefore means that we are not committed enough to fix them. All of us, in totality, we are not doing enough to fix them. Because every year, it gets a little bit worse. Every year, we make some progress in some areas. We make some regression in some areas. In every, every single five years or 10 years, you look back, you say, well, you know, we could have been much further because there was some significant missteps here. That has to change. And this is where we have to embrace the opportunity. And I further believe, I further believe, you know, um, I don't want to be over the top on this. And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm looking at this in a very positive way to underline the urgency which is needed. Here's my view. I've said this before. That the issues that we are faced with, if they're not arrested soon, arrested within the next five years, arrested within the next six, seven, maybe ten years, and ten years is kind of long, if they are not arrested with great urgency, the future price that we are going to pay not that we might pay. The future price that we will be asked to pay will be extremely, extremely uncomfortable. Today we are faced with situations of contemplating should we raise VAT or not? Some persons are saying, well, you shouldn't have cut the VAT. Some persons say, well, it's going to kill this era. And then, you know, there's a lot of things been said. Maybe the conversation should not be about whether to increase or reduce VAT to make things zero rated or exempt. Maybe the bigger conversation should be whether or not we should be pursuing still a regressive system of taxation versus a progressive system. See the shift? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, go out and do income tax. I am saying that if we are having the conversations within narrow confines over a long period of time, we're moving up, we're moving down, we're shifting here, we're shifting there, and those results are not significantly and fundamentally solving the big picture that the country is faced with, then maybe, just maybe, a fundamentally different approach is needed. Are we willing to have that conversation? I've heard recently a raising of the question as to whether or not we should have borrowed in local currency versus foreign currency. 
And it's a good conversation to have because the more you owe in your local currency, the stronger the position of the country is. But sometimes that conversation ignores the fact that the Bahamas has a peg. And that peg sits on reserve. And that reserve demands foreign currency. And if that foreign currency is not being earned, it must be borrowed. And that is why I ask, are we having the conversation in the right way to the fullness? It's a simple. It's not knocking anybody here and there. It's not new. It's not a new conversation. This has happened all the time. What I'm concerned about is that sometimes in these conversations, we are ignoring fundamental aspects of our realities for a desired outcome. So, how are we going to move forward? How are we going to shift the national narrative? How are we going to get to the place where we are embracing us rather than I and me? How are we going to say to ourselves, look, in the totality of this experiment called country, called democracy, called the Bahamas, at the end of the day, how will we work in such a way that we are all good? That we are better than yesterday, today. And tomorrow we will be better than we are today. And so on and so forth. Are we compelling ourselves? Will we compelling, compel ourselves to move away from our win-lose stance, generally speaking? our divided stance of I win, you lose, and get to the place where we start asking, how can we win together? How can we change the conversation which leads us in that direction? How can we do a better job at taking care of us, not just me or you? How can we all be better together? And it goes fundamentally to the question of how do we see us? Or maybe even a little bit more fundamental, do you see us? Is there a us in your vision? Is there a solid, concretized, Totality, like when you, 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 you make an alloy, alloy where you take different metals and you put them together so that it becomes this new hardened thing. Let that represent us. Do you see that within your vision, within your scope? Is that the way you look at country? Is that the way you see from day to day? Because if we get to that point, when we get to that point, then all of a sudden I believe that things are going to change and change fundamentally because it's no more competition with short-term and suboptimal outcomes but a desire, an effort, a working, a movement towards creating the best possible situation, the best possible circumstance for country for every single individual on the face of this rock of 700 islands and keys called the Bahamas. Are we there yet? Are we willing to be there? So, are we having the right conversations? Or at least, are we having the conversations in the right way? You have been listening to The Hit Back. I'm your host for today, Hubert Edwards. Nahaja Black will be back on Monday. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. All that is left to say is one love, walk good, Ubuntu, Jagai.